A very good morning to you from uh, beautiful Galway. I hope you're keeping safe and well wherever you are joining us from. Uh, this is the 27th in our series of signpost webinars where we examine the science, policy and advice underpinning farm sustainability in Ireland. My name is Mark Gibson. I'm manager of the Chagas Connected program. If you'd like to receive updates on training opportunities, latest publications and invitations to events from Chagask, I encourage you to sign up to the newly launched Chagask Connected Digital Program and you can join for free. The Signpost webinar series is being brought to you in association with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, the National Rural Network and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. Today you can send us your questions by clicking on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and today's session is being recorded and will be available to view afterwards along with a copy of the presentation on the Chagas website. So today we continue our focus on biodiversity by looking at the importance of semi-natural grasslands and how we can protect them. And I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Maria Long, who is grassland ecologist with the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Uh, Maria, you're very welcome to our webinar this morning. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Good, good. And Maria, you're uh, not unfamiliar with uh, many of our, our viewers here and uh, the, you're, you're from an, an agricultural uh, part of the world, I believe. Is that right? I am. I'm from dairy country uh, uh, in the Golden Vale, just outside Charleville in North Cork. Yeah. Very good. Very good. And so Maria, can you tell us a little bit about the work that you do in the National Parks and Wildlife Service? Okay, so I'm the grassland ecologist in the National Parks and Wildlife Service. I took up that position about a year and a half ago. And so I have responsibility for um, looking after some of our nicest semi-natural grasslands. And not so much looking after, but providing oversight of survey, providing advice about their management, um, reporting on them, monitoring them. So everything to do with semi-natural grasslands, really. Brilliant. Okay. So you're going to tell us more in your presentation. Just before we go to that, I want to introduce Pat Murphy, who has been... Uh, Minding the, 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 the house while I've been away for a couple of weeks uh, doing another assignments. So Pat, for, thanks for standing in for me and uh, you're gonna help us with questions afterwards. No problem, I was just a poor substitute, Mark. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, heard, I heard you did a great job. <laughs> I, 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 I'll have to be worried about uh, my, my role. <laughs> no, don't okay. think so. All right, uh, Maria, if uh, I can ask you to share your screen with us and you're going to give us about a 25, 30 minute presentation. And uh, please, uh, if, if anyone has questions for Maria, please use the, the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. So Maria, over to you. Okie dokie. Okay, so Pat, you, or Mark, you can let me know if that looks good. Yeah, that's perfect, Maria. Okie dokie. So hello to everybody and thanks so much for the opportunity to, to come and speak to you today about semi-natural grasslands. Um, so as we mentioned, I'm an ecologist. I have about 20 years experience as an ecologist and relatively recently I'm the grassland ecologist with the National Parks and Wildlife Service. I think it's important to mention that I'm not an agricultural specialist. Um, obviously there's, there's huge areas of overlap being a grassland ecologist, but do please bear with me uh, uh, if I'm not up to speed with maybe the nitty gritty of some agricultural policy, things like that. Um, what I am here to speak to you today about is semi-natural grasslands and I want to highlight these fantastic and valuable resources that we have in Ireland. And I think it's funny, given that Ireland is so uh, famous for and covered in grassland, I actually think semi-natural grasslands are some of the most invisible habitats we have. They're kind of hidden in plain sight. And they're hidden because very often people fail to recognise that they're different. They fail to see that oh, this is an interesting semi-natural grassland. But also they can be hidden, even if the difference is recognised, they can be hidden because their value isn't recognised. So we'll explore a bit about that today. So, um, there we go. Um, there's a slight delay in moving on the slides. So look, today I'm going to talk about what are semi-natural grasslands, and we have to do a bit of jargon busting to start off with, a bit of terminology so that we're all singing off the same hymn sheet. And that will involve talking about how we manage our grasslands, the management, the spectrum of managements we have. We we'll look at some of the key features and how to recognize these grasslands. We we'll look at where they're found, why they're important, and just touch on that. We we'll look at some of the issues that they're facing. Are they threatened? And we'll have a little bit of a focus on nutrients. Look, it's a short period of time to talk about so many different things, but I'll give a couple of tips, the kind of key things if you're managing really nice semi-natural grasslands or aiming to have semi nice semi-natural grasslands. A couple of take-home messages and some online resources. Okie dokie, so let's start with some terminology. Uh, and this is, this is important to, to kind of make sure we're, we're all on, on the same page. 
So you might wonder, why do we call them semi-natural grasslands? Well, natural grasslands don't exist in Ireland. They exist elsewhere in the world. And they're large areas, think of savannas in Africa, prairies in North America, that are very little altered by man. And they're grasslands because of the prevailing climate, uh, that maybe there's not enough water to support tree growth. Maybe there's a fire cycle. There's frequent enough fires that trees can't get hold. Maybe there's large, large herds of herbivores. In other words, these are the natural plant communities. That isn't the case in Ireland. So in Ireland, we have either what we call semi-natural grasslands, the focus of the talk today, or improved grasslands. And improved grasslands make up the, the majority of our grasslands, certainly in parts of the country, and these are used intensively for agriculture. But given that I've mentioned that we're in Ireland, we're not in, in the part of the world where natural grasslands are the norm, you know, humans weren't here and managing the land, so why, why then is there so much grassland in Ireland? And it is precisely that. It's because of thousands of years of human uh, agricultural use of the landscape. So farmers manage most of our land in Ireland. Much of our rich biodiversity has evolved from this agricultural management. And so farmers by default are such important custodians and managers of biodiversity in Ireland. So before we move away from the terminologies, a couple of other terms that I want to touch on and make sure that we're kind of clear where they sit within, within this bigger picture. So what about species rich? So you'll hear the term and you've probably heard the term species rich grassland. Um, are semi-natural grasslands always species rich? No, but they often are. An improved grassland though will never be species rich. It will always have been changed to such an extent by agricultural management that it's no longer supporting many different types of plant species. Now, I can't give you a magic figure about how many species uh, tips, tips a grassland over into being called species rich. It's really context dependent, but it's usually fairly obvious. You walk in and you see something that's nice and flower rich and diverse. The photograph on the right hand side is an example of a species rich wet grassland. What about a multi-species sward? Uh, you might wonder, is that the same as a species rich grassland? Well, it isn't. And so it's important to understand what's meant there. So a multi-species sward is much more an agricultural term and it applies to the practice of adding in a handful of species into an agricultural sward. It's hugely valuable within intensively farmed grasslands and in improved grasslands because it brings an element of extra diversity but it is not uh, the same as a species rich grassland. It's about adding in a small handful of species into an already quite, quite poor um, sward in terms of plant diversity. And then what about HNV, high nature value farmland? You might wonder what's the overlap between high nature value farmland and semi-natural grasslands. So look, a lot of the grassland in high nature value farms and high nature value farmland will be semi-natural, but it won't necessarily all be. That term, the HNV term, kind of applies to the whole farm or the whole landscape. So these farms will be managed in a low intensity way. They'll typically be good for and fairly rich in biodiversity and nature. Uh, but not every single field will be semi-natural grassland. There may be some improved fields and there'll be fields on the spectrum. I'm going to talk now in, in a second in the spectrum that runs in between semi-natural and, and improved. So again, semi-natural grasslands are the focus today. They are altered by man. They're altered by and for agriculture but the extent to which the grasslands are altered varies. And this is the, the important thing to understand. So in the, the photograph on the screen there, we have an improved grassland. So let's talk about the, the spectrum of management and the intensity of management and how that, um, how that feeds into whether we consider a grassland as improved or semi-natural or somewhere in between. So intensive agriculture will involve some or all of the following, uh, plowing, reseeding, fertilizing. So all of those will have taken place in the, the grassland that we see in the, the photograph here. Typically high stocking rates. They'll often be the use of chemicals to manage uh, pests associated with the, the crops. They'll often be uh, field boundary removal and this will be related to trying to move machinery around efficiently, efficiencies of scale. So these are the types of things that, that are involved in agricultural, uh, in intensive agriculture, leading to improved grasslands. At the other end of the spectrum, we have extensive farming. And I've put up a photograph now of a very nice, very high quality semi-natural grassland. Not all grassland can be like this, not all semi-natural grassland is like this, but this is a good example at the other end of the spectrum, and we can recognize that there'll be lots of things in between. So at this other end of the spectrum, extensive farming. And again, you can have a look at this photograph and you can imagine this will never have been plowed. It probably won't have been reseeded, little or no fertilization low stocking densities, little or no chemical use, though there might be treatment of rushes, for example, spot treatment. Field boundaries are much more uh, routinely retained in this kind of situation. 
So I think it's important to, to, to understand the spectrum and, and the influence that the management has on the type of grassland. So look, semi-natural grasslands are inherently low nutrient habitats and they need ongoing management. So our nicest semi-natural grasslands are usually low nutrient habitats and all grasslands need ongoing management. So look, some of you might be saying, okay, improved or semi-natural and, and, and all of this, what, what does it matter? What are the implications? So what? And the thing is, yes, it, it really does matter, particularly when you're look, thinking about nature and environmental concerns and biodiversity. So in your typical improved field, for example, a silage or a dairy field, it's going to be dominated by one or a few species of plant, typically uh, ryegrass, perennial ryegrass, probably Ireland's most common plant. Uh, there'll be a handful of other species, and these are usually species that cope well in high nutrient, high competition scenarios like clovers, docks, thistles, nettles. So these are the agriculturally favoured species. Production will be high on these types of, of uh, land, so production of fodder, uh, of beef, of dairy, whatever it might be, but other services will be lower. Biodiversity is one of those things. Uh, there's definitely a trade-off. Look, there's a trade-off in everything we do in life. So in a semi-natural grassland, and again, I've included a photo of an exceptionally diverse grassland in the knowledge that they're not all that good, but let's you know, talk about the ends of the spectrum. You're gonna have much higher diversity in a semi-natural grassland. No matter where it sits on the spectrum, if it hasn't been fertilized and reseeded, it will have more diversity. So it's going to be more species in there, as well as that there's going to be more diversity of structure, different types of plants, different heights, different rooting depths. It's going to be more diversity in the soil. And obviously the soil is so hugely important. If you haven't plowed, reseeded and added lots of uh, chemicals to the soil, you're going to have a much more healthy soil. There will be more things living in there and things that we know so little about, fungal networks, hugely important. In terms of the plant species, in a grassland like the one in the photograph there, a semi-natural grassland, you can have over 40 species easily in a two by two meter area. And just think about that. There will be, you would, you would struggle to reach 10 species in the whole field, perhaps for the, for the upper grassland. So with that added diversity comes higher resilience. Each of those different plants in the more diverse ward are adapted to different conditions. So if we get drier or wetter weather, because of climate change, there will be certain species that are more adaptable, things with deeper roots, things with better um, stress tolerance. So there are lots of other benefits as well that come with higher diversity, but resilience is one of them. But again, obviously there's a trade-off. We need productive ground, we need diverse, diverse land as well. So just, I quite like this graphic. I, I think you can see my, my cursor. So let's start here at the top left. Um, we have a landscape here with a lot of diversity, a lot of small fields, different management going on. There's hedgerows, there's areas of woodland. And on the right hand side, we have a, this little matrix and it represents the fact that there are niches, there's space for lots of different animals from the bugs and the beasties, the amphibians, birds, the mammals. They have a place to live, a place to shelter, a place to feed when you've got a landscape that's very diverse. As we move down to the middle section, the landscape here is becoming more simplified fewer fields, fewer field boundaries, less woody cover. And certainly you can imagine slightly less space for nature. So some of the little boxes here in the matrix are now empty. We're losing some of our species. And if we take it down to another degree down here at the bottom, if we have a very simplified landscape uh, like, like is represented here, highly productive agriculturally, but very, very simplified. The poor old stream has been canalized and um, there are now no field boundaries to speak of. And we've got just maybe one or two types of crops grown in monoculture. So we're losing a huge amount of the space for nature in that type of landscape. Um, and just to, to kind of tie in with that, with, with real world examples, rather than looking at, at drawings, the upper shot here is a screen grab from an area in Leitrim relatively typical of a lot of Leitrim. Down here, a screen grab from an area in Wexford. Again, relatively typical from, uh, you know, of a lot of Wexford. Now, just in case anybody from Wexford is up in arms, uh, I, I'm not saying that, that everyone in Wexford must give up farming, not at all. But what we want to do is we want to take uh, and think about land like this that's highly productive. We want to think about how simplified we've made it. Can we add in back, uh, add back in facets, little bits of uh, support structures for nature, field boundaries, the streams, the width of the field margins, uh, some boxes for owls, uh, lots of different measures that can be taken to 
at a very, very low cost and at almost no impact on production, and perhaps sometimes added benefit for production, if we have healthier hedgerow networks, we might have healthier bird populations, which might, uh, uh, they're fantastic pest control agents of crop pests. We can see actually added benefits for very little cost, sometimes by making a little bit more space for nature in the more productive of our landscapes. And then up here, if we have a, a landscape that's like this, we need to find ways to support and value this type of farm management. The biggest risk here is land abandonment, is that people are no longer able to farm. It is also a risk that the land might be improved, but the wetter the land, the, 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 the more marginal it is, the less likelihood of improvement and the higher likelihood of abandonment. So we need to find ways to value and adequately support people that farm in landscapes like this. And at the moment, I mean, I think it should be very obvious, uh, one size does not fit all in terms of how we look at and make decisions about the best land uses. Production is probably the best use here. Other benefits are probably the, the things to value here. So I'm not going to spend much time on this slide. By the way, some people that have seen some other talks I've given this year, some of these slides will be familiar. There's, there's new stuff too, so don't worry. Um, this will be available for you to look at afterwards in the copy of the talk uh, and in the recording of the talk. I've quickly highlighted some of the things that jumped out at me as some of the services performed for us by semi-natural grasslands. And some of these services are performed much better by semi-natural grasslands rather than improved grasslands. So for example, wild species diversity, um, support for pollinators. So there's an, uh, it, water quality issues. So look, there's a lot to digest here. I'm not gonna go into that as part of this talk, but it is something that's very well worth thinking about. I'll highlight, of course, here, livestock forage is something that's gonna be a big trade-off if we're managing semi-natural grasslands that are less productive. But I did think I wanted to pull out uh, just one or two small examples of some of the things that are of value and often overlooked. There's a photograph there, and I'm not telling everybody to start farming thistles, <laughs> far from it. There's a photograph there featuring marsh thistle um, in a field. Marsh thistle has been shown to be the best nectar provider to pollinators in a study of over 250 native plant species in the UK. And I found that quite surprising. So the humble thistle, has a hugely important role to play in feeding pollinators. The thistle is also host to at least 37 different species of invertebrate that live on or in the plant. Again, I'm not advocating that we farm thistles, I'm just saying that things often have a value that isn't apparent to us at first glance. Um, plant on the top left there is called Devil's Bit Scabious. It's, it's in flower around now, you find it in peaty, wettier grasslands. Um, it supports at least 25 insect species and it's the only food plant for one of our rarest butterflies, the marsh fritillary butterfly. Okay, so let's take it, let's take it that we have a, a general understanding that semi-natural grasslands are very valuable to us for, for a variety of reasons. And you might be thinking, God, how do I recognize? How do I know maybe if I have a semi-natural grassland? So I'm gonna have a little bit of, tiny bit of sciencey stuff later on, but just some general, very broad, um, tips for how do you recognize a semi-natural grassland. So look, I think we're, we're clear on the image on the bottom. I don't think anybody's gonna suggest that that's semi-natural. It's far too uniform. But what about the, the picture above? I mean, we all, this is what I do for a living. And I still have to remind myself, well, that isn't messy. This is, this is natural. Nature often looks messy to our eye. So what are the things we're looking for? Other than thinking, God, that looks a mess. Why, do, why doesn't that farmer tidy that up? So I'm looking for lots of species. I don't want to see a sward dominated by one or a small handful of grass species. I want to see lots of different plant species. And I want to see lots of herbaceous species. So we often say herbs. We don't mean culinary herbs, we mean herbaceous species. We mean basically the flowers, the flowering plants. So the proportion of kind of flowering plants to grasses, the higher the proportion of flowering plants, that's a really good indicator of how semi-natural the grassland is or how little altered it is by agriculture. You want to see lots of insect life. That's kind of weather dependent. So there's many a day I work in Ireland and I don't see much insect life because it's cold or it's raining. But you do want to see that and you do want to be aware that it's there. Sometimes you'll have, you'll have other elements like good healthy moss cover. You might have rocks apparent. You might have scrub and bushes and ferns. You might have anthills. Basically, any of those occurring really tells me that the plough hasn't been here recently, particularly anthills. 
So if I see features like that, like outcropping rock, like anthills, like little patches of scrub and bushes, I know that the land isn't being ma managed very intensively and that it probably hasn't been ploughed and reseeded. So they're very obvious in one way, but not, maybe not if you don't explicitly think about it. So look, the land is often lumpy and bumpy and it can be messy looking, particularly at certain times of the year. In terms then of kind of, you know, groups of species that are really good indicators of a semi-natural grassland. So the picture on the right that's just popped up uh, is a sedge. So these are kind of like grasses. They look like grasses. They've got skinny leaves like grasses. And the flower on the left-hand side is an orchid. Orchids and sedges are two groups of plants that are lost very quickly when management intensity increases. So the presence of orchids and sedges in a, in a, in a grassland tell me something about the management. They tell me that it's low intensity management typically. So I like to see the presence of orchids and sedges. Orchids also are very fussy. They need to have a relationship with fungi under the ground. Now, actually, 90% of our native plant species need relationship with fungi underground. So having healthy soils and excellent fungal networks are also key indicators. But look, that can be hard to tell, especially if you're looking over the farm gate and wondering, is this a semi-natural grassland? So healthy soils and the fungal networks are very important, but can be hard to tell. But we can use things like the species that are growing there to infer the health or otherwise of the soil. Okay, so the different types of grasslands we have. So this is the this is a little bit sciencey, but roll with me. Uh, there's not there isn't too much detail, and I'll talk you through it. So there was a very big survey done called the Irish Seminatural Grassland Survey between 2007 and 2012. It was commissioned by National Parks and Wildlife Service, and as part of that survey, just under 1,200 grassland sites were visited with seminatural grassland. Um, almost four and a half thousand quadrats were carried out. So this is where people, uh, um, ecologists, made a plant list, a really detailed plant list for a two by two meter square, it's called a quadrat. And about 23,000 hectares of semi-natural grassland were mapped. That's not the full extent, that's just a sample of semi-natural grasslands in Ireland. And look, via data analysis from these data and some others as well, patterns have been pulled out and four main grassland types have been identified. So I'm just going to tell you about the patterns and the types very quickly. Now, don't worry any bit at all about the details there on the right hand side. I'm going to talk to you about the patterns. They're there just for colour and for, for, um, for interest. OK, so the first pattern uh, that became apparent is that species richness was higher on grasslands on slopes. Um, now, this is really an artefact of where grasslands have survived. There's nothing inherent about slopes or that grasslands like slopes. It's just that it has been harder to improve. It's been harder to plough and reseed grasslands that are on slopes. So we now have a strong relationship between species rich, gra species rich grasslands and slopes. Uh, what is a, a very strong relationship is between species richness and fertility. So species richness is lowest on soils with high fertility. Um, fertility was looked at in these analyses in terms of soil phosphorus, and that was the strongest, clearest relationship. High phosphorus means low species richness, but also fertility uh, in terms of nitrogen as well. It was also a strong relationship. In terms of the other main patterns, no surprises, the pH of the soil helps separate out grassland types. So if it's acid, it's going to be very different to calcareous or basic. And also wetness and dryness was one of the big drivers between the different types of grasslands. So look, the main patterns make a lot of sense intuitively. So let me just tell you about the four types of semi-natural grassland. So it's a little, a little description and a photograph of each. So the first one is species poor, damp or wet grasslands. These are usually on fairly fertile soils, often on flattish land. So look, think of your typical rushy field. And this is one of the main types of semi-natural grassland that, that may grade into the improved grassland category. The second type are also wet grasslands. They're maybe on more peaty soils. They can be quite species rich, and that's quite closely related again with the soil fertility. So think for this type of grassland, of a kind of more species rich, low nutrient wet field. If you want to picture it in your mind's eye, like in the photograph there. The third grassland type is a calcareous grassland type, very often quite species rich, usually quite nutrient poor soils, sometimes on slopes, as we mentioned. And for the best examples of these, think of a burn grassland or an esker grassland, maybe. The, the, they exist outside those, those areas too. And the fourth type are the acid grasslands. So these are often species rich, they're on neutral to acid soils. Again, they're nutrient poor soils typically, often on slopes. And you can picture in your mind's eye, maybe an upland acid grassland. Okie dokie. So that's a run through of the main types of grassland and hopefully they, you know, they, they, they kind of sit relatively well in terms of, uh, of being kind of intuitive. Where do we find these types of grasslands? Uh, so I'm just going to give you a, a very, very quick overview so you have a, a bit of a picture. 
And I'm going to start by presenting a map that a lot of you are going to be familiar with, the predicted distribution of high nature value farmland. So on this map, the green represents a high, high likelihood of high, na high nature value farmland, the yellow moderate and the blue is low. And this is a great map because it gives us, even though it's based on modeling, it gives us quite an accurate representation of where we're likely to find high nature value farmland and also semi-natural grassland. They're, they're closely linked, as I mentioned at the start. You, I've looked at this map and I've also overlaid things like farm income, where the dairy farms are, farm size. There are lots of different other uh, stats that we can overlay and it gives a very similar pattern. So it does hold true. So look, the overall pattern is that the majority of our semi-natural grasslands are found in the western and northern parts of the country, but there's no country that doesn't have semi a county. There's no county that doesn't have semi-natural grassland. It's just less common in some counties compared to others. So I'm going to bring up on the left hand side now a series of maps. No need to worry about the detail. I just wanted to look at the pattern and the pattern again is, is broadly similar. So these are maps for some of our more special habitats. So we have some grassland habitats that are of a really particular vegetation type and they're, they're considered to be really rare at European level. So they're listed on the habitats directive. And again, no need to worry about the detail or the names or anything, just to broadly look at the, at the maps. And again, you can see from where we know that these habitats exist, these special grassland types, that again, there's a very Western and Northwestern distribution. But again, you'll see, if you look for your own county, you'll see that there's no county that doesn't have examples of at least one of these really special grassland types. Okay, so we've had a look at what they are, why they're important and where they are. Are they under threat? Um, so in order to answer that question, I'm going to give you some information relating to those really special subset of the grassland types because we have detailed data for those, whereas we lack it maybe for the broader countryside. So for these best of the best sites. So I mentioned already the big grassland survey that ran for five years, 2007, 2012. Well, we ran another survey, MPWS commissioned a monitoring survey more recently, 2015 to 2017, and a subset of the sites from the first survey were revisited. And there was an average of a six year gap in between surveys. So only six years between these sites being revisited. And they found that for the nicest of the nice calcareous grasslands, 31% of them were gone, which is stark. For Millennium Meadows, which is a particular type of kind of wet grassland found on peaty soils, 7% were gone. And for our really nice species rich traditional hay meadows, 28% were gone. This is just in a six year period. And these figures are going to be underestimates because they're from a subset of the best sites. So the losses in the wider countryside are likely to be higher. And just to give a little bit of context, these really special habitats, these ones that are listed on the Habitats Directive, they consist of only a tiny area of the farmed grassland in Ireland. I did a quick calculation back of an envelope and I think it's about 0.08% of the farmed grassland. Um, I think we've got about 3,000 hectares of these types of grassland <clears throat> and about 3.7 million hectares of farmed grassland in Ireland. So they're a tiny proportion. They're really important and really special and we're still losing them at the rate of knots. So this is alarming. Why are we losing them? What are the threats? So there are two main threats and the first one won't be a surprise. The second one might be. So the first th main threat is habitat loss. So conversion to intensive agriculture or more intensive agriculture. Um, forestry is a, is a big issue and it's going to become bigger. And, uh, you know, as we, as we move towards kind of policy driven uh, afforestation. Uh, quarrying, obviously, quarrying on eskers. If you, if you quarry an esker, you, you've lost the grass and that's it. And in terms of the intensive agriculture, what's happening is fertilization, reseeding, draining. Those are kind of the main agents uh, of change. But I mentioned the second one might be a surprise. So in tandem with habitat loss due to conversion to intensive agriculture, we have abandonment. And it is a huge issue, absolutely huge. The change is less drastic and less immediate, but it applies to huge areas. Grasslands need management. And so if the management ceases or, or decreases, you have changes and loss of quality in the grasslands. So look, the key message is semi-natural grasslands absolutely need management, but that management needs to be appropriate. It needs to be at the extensive end of the scale rather than intensive for our semi-natural grasslands, for our best of the best, for sure. So I said I would focus a little bit on nutrients uh, and fertilizers as, you know, as part of one of the main threats to our semi-natural grasslands. So apart from reseeding, it's the most damaging activity. And look, reseeding is very drastic and very obvious. Uh, and 
anybody that's reseeding a semi-natural grassland, they know that they're changing the habitat completely, but it might be just a little bit less obvious how damaging application of fertilizers are. And there might be a lot of advice being given and farmers carrying out fertilization and not realizing the, the change that they're instigating. So look, a semi-natural grassland is valuable because of the variety of plant species within it and all the animals that those species support and all the services that they combined provide. And if you add nutrients, you drastically alter the species composition. It's absolutely no question. You give a huge competitive advantage to a handful of grasses and other species, and you squeeze out most of the other plants. So just a, a, a few sources of, of uh, you know, studies that have shown this. So again, I just mentioned that the 4,500 samples from the Irish Semi-Natural Grassland Survey, I'm putting up this graph again, and I'm going to ask you to look at where the blue arrows are pointing. Um, so on the right hand side, there's a blue arrow pointing at species richness and at the left hand side, the blue arrows are pointing at soil phosphorus and fertility. So as I mentioned, a huge driver uh, of whether a grassland is species rich or not is the fertility. So if soil phosphorus and fertility are high or if they're, if they're added in, you're going to see a consequent drop in species richness. The graph below, bottom right, is from an Estonian long-term study. Um, if you can see my cursor, so from 1960 to 1980, fertilizer was applied to certain plots and they had controls nearby with none. And this grassland has been studied from 1960 up to the very recent past. Uh, studies just published this year. Um, I'll ask you just for the moment to focus on the orange stars. So at the start, the orange stars represent the, the species. So at the start of fertilization, you have quite high species numbers and these drop off. These are actually represented as um, in relation to the control, compared to the control, but the, the, the message is the same, regardless of, of how, we, how we say it. The species number drops off dramatically as fertilization is occurring and then starts to increase and track back up again once the fertilization stops. So a clear relationship between fertilization and species. And actually the impact of fertilization on the biomass was detectable for over 10 years after they stopped. The increase in the biomass of legumes was noticeable up to 35 years after the fertilization stopped. And the previously fertilized plots still have 5% fewer plant species compared to controlled plots. By way of another example, there's work going on in the burn at the moment. It's part of a huge global study. If you want to read more, nutnet.org, Nutrient Network, uh, that stands for. And in this burn study site, I've, I've done some work. I've just helped out the, the main researchers there. Yvonne Buckley and Trinity is leading that study. Um, they have set up plots where they're adding phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium, or they're removing grazing and all the combinations of those. And they have controls as well. And they've shown the effects of phosphorus on diversity, it really stands out. It's strong. There are dramatic decreases in species number in just three years, and there are remarkable shifts in abundances. It really is amazing. A small number of grasses and legumes are favored to the cost of all the other species. So it's really clear, uh, certainly in, in, uh, in, in, in some habitats, that phosphorus uh, has a huge impact. And it, you might think, well, but that's the burn. It, it isn't just the burn. Uh, another study in Germany where there were 60, 64 years of fertilizer, fertilizer application, uh, the influence of phosphorus was also shown to be greatest there. Species which were indicative of low productivity grasslands didn't survive in that experiment. So look, Overall, I think um, the current kind of advice that comes out from, from um, uh, agricultural bodies and, and Chagask is that we're aiming for optimum soil P and K to be at index three. And the kind of message is that 90% of our soils aren't at the right level. They're at suboptimal level for either phosphorus or, or another, another nutrient or measurement. And my point is, this advice is applicable if production is your main aim for a particular landscape or farm or area of land. But production isn't the only thing. And there's a huge cost to aiming for this level of increased fertility if semi-natural grassland, biodiversity, carbon sequestration, water quality, soil health, if these are your main aims. So it's a little bit apples and oranges. We're currently giving out advice, I think, uh, without, uh, and, and we're saying this, this should be applied to all farms. 90% of all soils sampled are not really suboptimal. They're suboptimal if productivity is your main aim. And we need to maybe differentiate which lands uh, we have productivity as our main aim or not. So I'm going to move, I'm going to skip this for a second and I'm going to look at, because um, I'm conscious of my time, uh, look at the impacts of some of this biodiversity loss on Irish species. So 
I'll point you to a recent publication. It's a red list for plants in Ireland, for our vascular plants. What this does is it assesses the threat status. How threatened are they with extinction or not? So the purple circle on this table, again, I'm going kind of quickly through this, but just I'll highlight the, the main points. That purple circle tells us that 15 species have gone extinct in Ireland of plant in recent times. And that's already a stark enough figure. But over on the right hand side, 17% of our plant species have a threat status associated with them. So we've, they've been deemed in a recent assessment to be under threat of extinction. That's almost one in five of our native plant species. So look, we are seeing effects on our nature here in Ireland in, uh, because of the choices that we make with land management. In terms of animal species, uh, just a couple of bird examples. I doubt there's anyone here that isn't familiar with the, the plight of the corncrake. In 1970, we had about 4,000 calling males. We now have a handful. And this is to do with changing land management and changing agriculture. Corn bunting is now thought to be lost. Twice population declines of about 98%. Reading curlew and lapwing are down about 90%. All the birds listed here are farmland or farm reliant, you know, farmland reliant bird species to one extent or another. So we are seeing impacts on Irish species. But um, while this uh, all sounds very negative and doom and gloom, I want to talk about and to touch on some of the things we can do, some of the things that we are doing, some of the things that many of our new projects that are up and running, our results-based project, projects, our EIPs, European Innovation Partnership projects, some of the things that are happening. What are the key things that are good for semi-natural grasslands? What do we want to see more of, do more of, support more of, where it's appropriate in our landscape? So the first thing is nutrients. We need to reduce or stop nutrient inputs and this will allow more species to thrive. So this is a key thing, talked about it already. Grazing, we wanna to try to move back to some of the traditional breeds. They're hardier, lighter, and they thrive better on rougher vegetation. Winter grazing is fantastic, particularly for drier habitats, for well-drained habitats. And traditional breeds make this so much more feasible. We want stocking rates to be low to moderate. And again, remember, I'm talking about managing our semi-natural grasslands, this subset of kind of high nature value uh, lands that we have. I'm not suggesting everybody moves to this. Um, mowing, if you've got a mown situation, if you've got uh, a meadow, mowing late allows as many species as possible to flower and set seed. So that is good for biodiversity in that situation. In terms of drainage, review the drains. Some are beneficial and needed in order to, to allow continued uh, grazing or grassland management but manage the drains in an ecological sen uh, ecologically sensitive way and probably not creating new ones. And obviously reseeding is not compatible with managing semi-natural grasslands. Okay, so my take home messages. These are kind of things that jumped out at me as I was putting this talk together as some of the key things. So look, one of the main things, keep farming. Uh, often it, it might feel, and I hope it didn't feel during this talk, but it might feel like we're ecologists or conservationists are pointing the finger at farmers, blaming farmers. We're not. The, the, there is no fault at the door of individual farmers. What we need to do is rethink some of our policies and some of our incentivizations. Keep farming. Our grasslands, our biodiversity needs farming. What we need to do is we need to recognize differing values of different farms and different parcels of land. Some are going to be optima, optimal for producing food and fodder intensively. And in others, we're throwing good money after bad, we're trying to fight what's there, and we should be farming more with nature and delivering other benefits. And I really do think this is the future of farming. Increasingly, land and nature is being valued for a range of services. Biodiversity, carbon storage, water quality, water retention, pollinator habitat, genetic diversity, the list is endless. There is a lot of value to our land and our nature aside of and as well as pr production of food. And remember all of these habitats and farms that are managed with nature in mind, they're still producing just at a lower level. But even in intensive farming at the other end of the spectrum, we must find a way to retain some space for nature. We must retain some nature within those. And that can be done. Look at the example again, I'll mention it again, the Bride Project is working, doing fantastic work at that end of the spectrum, finding ways that intensive farmers can maintain production, maintain profits, but make their farms that little bit more biodiversity friendly. And look, we all, I include myself in this too, we all need to continue to learn and to be informed. This makes for better decision making when it comes to farming and land management decisions. Um, we need to be open to different ways of thinking, to new ways of working, and we need to be open to different uh, viewpoints. I think a lot of our agricultural advice and policy has become quite blinkered towards production only. And that's not the only value that we can get from our farmland. 
So look, I've gone over my time, I reckon. Thank you so much for listening. The resources are going to be up on the, the, um, the, the copy of the talk that will be up online. My email address is there if anybody wants to get in touch. I'm on Twitter at Grasslands IRL. And I've put a couple of hashtags there if you want to know more and follow some updates about semi-natural grassland. And I will stop there before Mark makes me stop. <laughs> Maria, thank you so much. Um, a really inspiring talk, I have to say. I, I really enjoy that now. And uh, you. you learn learn something new. Uh, I, I remember my, my lectures in college from John Feehan, and uh, he, he, he was a great man for inspiring you to... to uh, to, to look after the semi-natural grasslands and, and the boglands and so on. We've loads and loads of questions coming in here, Maria. So you've obviously, uh, you know, hit, hit the right notes there. And okay. also over 300 people <clears throat> listening in today. So as well, it's, it's, okay. it's, it's great to see so, such interest great. in this topic. Um, I mean, you talk about the, the uh, I suppose, the general advice that is provided uh, around grassland and not making that differentiation between, you know, productive grassland or intensively uh, managed grassland versus semi-natural grassland. Uh, and, and look, I agree with you. I think we need to uh, be more refined about the advice that, that's given and that it's, it's appropriate and that really it's a farm level advice that, that mm -hmm. needs to be given uh, based on uh, you know, individual circumstances. Um, you know, wh what, what are the, the policies that you'd like to see put in place to, to, uh, to support farmers uh, that are uh, farming these semi-natural grasslands and, and are doing a fine job, but are oftentimes don't feel like they're being recognized or being yeah. remunerated for, for yeah. that really important work? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the one of the big things that we're currently lacking is that farmers that are managing some of these really nice areas that they, they don't feel they're that they're being valued uh, in a in in many senses. And certainly the money the money is part of it. But people need to feel a sense of purpose and they need to feel their land is valued. And there's many a farm I've walked where I've oohed and awed at the fantastic floral diversity. And the farmers said, "That's the first time anybody said there was anything nice here." And it is amazing the change that can make to feel supported and valued. And it isn't simply about the money, but of course, everyone has to make a living. So that has to be part of it. So I think we're, we're actually leaders in Ireland in terms of advancing the results-based agriculture models. So we look, so those types of models, the, the burn program, many people here will be familiar with some of, some of them. The burn program led the way, and we've got 23 different projects, the EIPs, the uh, UP, European Innovation Projects. I've included a link to those in that final slide. Um, a lot of those are using results-based agriculture. So you're looking at the quality of habitat, you're looking at the quantity, but the quality is very important. So you get a score, and as you move up that score, you get increased payments. So I think we need to see that type of model be more mainstreamed. We want to see more farmers be able to avail of that. Um, at the minute, we're obviously in a, a place of great change and flux in terms of what will come out in the new cap. With, and, and Ireland will have a large amount of freedom in how, how it um, how CAP takes shape within Ireland. So I think we're at a place of great opportunity to see a mainstreaming of valuing of land for different purposes aside of production alone. And we would be very wise to make that distinction because you really are throwing good money after bad, reseeding a boggy hillside. You're just always going to be fighting nature there. So can we maximize what that land you know, is naturally uh, you know, better at producing? And it might not be perennial ryegrass. So I think we need to see more mainstreaming through the main schemes, but we also need to see maybe a, a, an upscaling of some of the existing EIPs, some of the existing larger uh, results-based schemes, the Pearl Muscle Project, the Hen Harrier Project, the Bride Project. Look, I'm not familiar with all of them, so I'm sorry if I'm not name checking some, but I'm familiar with those. They're particularly far reaching, either in being very innovative or in their, their, their ge geographical scale, and they're being shown to work. The farmers love these schemes. They're, they're interacting with them, they're getting a lot from them, and nature is benefiting too. So we need to upscale some of those and find a way to, to make those types of um, financial incentivization mm -hmm. available to more farmers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine a few people screaming at the, the screen here saying that we have, we have the evidence and uh, it's a question of really pulling those, the likes of the HNV uh, type uh, programs mm -hmm. into, into policy now. 
Um, we, we have quite a few questions coming in, just, just a general theme coming through. I see people asking about restoration of, of uh, semi-natural grasslands okay. and, and also a question about, uh, is it advisable to be importing or, or sowing uh, wildflower meadows? Is that something that you would condone? Okay, so those are very interesting questions and worthy of a talk or two on their own, but I'm delighted that they've been brought up, absolutely delighted. <clears throat> so in terms of restoration in general, it's funny, again, grasslands can be so invisible. If somebody goes out and fells an old oak woodland, there's immediate uproar and people understand what's lost. And even if somebody goes back in and plants oak saplings, everyone understands that it's going to take 50 or 100 years for this to be anywhere close to what it was before. It is analogous with grasslands, but it's not as obvious. So if you have an ancient grassland, an old grassland that's never been ploughed or reseeded, and it's ploughed and reseeded, let's say it's ploughed and receded this year and somebody thinks better of it for whatever reason, or there's something enforced on them and they're asked to restore it. It's a little bit like you can go back in, you can take out your lolium perenne, but once you have kind of damaged the soil, once you have removed the species that were there, once you've interrupted the fungal networks, it's as hard to recreate a fully functioning species rich grassland as it is to, to, to recreate an ancient woodland. So restoration is possible but it's a long-term thing and it just, it just the, you know, the, it, it should never be a go-to that, oh, look, sure, we'll, we'll get what we can out of this and sure, we can always, we can always try and reverse this. It. Mm -hmm. it doesn't work that simply. The complexities of the soil and the networks that have built up over many years are just so hard to recreate quickly. Mm -hmm. If you are restoring an area, so I don't, I don't want to put down restoration, but I want people to be realistic about what it can achieve. Mm -hmm. If you are going to restore an area, wildflower seeds are hugely problematic in that what many, many people do is they go to the supermarket, really well-meaning, and they buy a packet of wildflower seed. Almost all of that will not be from Ireland. It'll be grown in another country, and it will not be the same species. It'll be either different species that are not native to Ireland, or it'll be a cultivar that's different to what we have. We see this up and down our roadsides in particular now. A lot of the roadside verges have beautiful wildflower mixes, but I don't know if anyone else has noticed. The cowslips are very big and tall. Mm. The uh, red clover is huge. So these are um, cultivars of our native species. So they're very different. So look, um, getting wildflower mixes is a tricky business. We don't have a lot of suppliers. We have a couple in the country. Um, one of the best things you can do is work with what's left in your site, work with, or, or work what's existing. You'd be amazed what can survive in the seed bank or bring in green hay from nearby, from another one of your fields, or maybe a neighbor's field, something in the locality. And by green hay, this means you cut, cut hay from a field that's semi-natural nearby, and on the same day, you bring it to the, to the field you want to restore. And in that field, you shake out the hay, you let it dry, and in that way, you introduce seed from nearby. And it's a very low impact way of bringing a spe relevant species into a sward. So look, buying your, your, your seed mixes from over the counter in a supermarket or in most garden centers, it's probably appropriate for gardens and roundabouts and urban situations. It definitely isn't usually appropriate for, for kind of wildflower meadow restoration in the wider countryside. Okay, thank you. thanks for that, Maria. Pat, a lot, lot more questions coming. Yeah, there. Uh, a lot in the, the policy area. Uh, James Moore and Grace talk, Maria. What do you think are the main barriers to the rollout uh, of the obvious results-based uh, payment solution, uh, indicating that there is a lot of evidence now to, to show that it works, but what are the barriers? Um, God, it's funny, human nature. I think we, uh, it's like trying to turn, a, turn the Titanic or stop a, stop a moving train. We have, I just think, become very blinkered in terms of how we think about agriculture and it's, it's agricultural production. I almost said it there myself. We, so I think we've just become stuck in a mindset that there's one way to farm and that always the objective of your farming should be production with the understanding that that production is fodder or beef or dairy or you know whatever that might be. And actually that's a, a quite a simplified way of looking at land management and farming. We can be producing those things at a lesser scale while supporting other services. So I think mindset uh, is one of the biggest things. I think people would need to be deaf now not to be hearing these messages and understanding them. Um, I think one of the things that's changing as well in terms of changing mindset, so you know that's maybe up at the policy level, down at the, the, the ground level, speaking to farmers, what we're starting to see more of is peer-to-peer -peer learning and sharing. So the Farming for Nature group 
whereby they kind of celebrate farmers that are already farming with nature in mind in a kind of an extensive way. And they're having farm walks where the farmers are leading and speaking for themselves. So I think that's, that's a powerful way to, to change mindsets, peer-to-peer -peer learning and, and farmers speaking to farmers. But I think we, we just need to keep plugging away at, at the, the big policy, um, the big policy juggernauts that, that are based on this mindset that there's only, one, oh, there's only one way and that way is up in terms of production. And so to me, that's one of the biggest things. I don't, I don't think that's going to answer James's question yeah. really, um, but and to I, me, that's I, one I, of the biggest things. I suppose a, a, a kind of a more specific thing uh, from Carl Richards, what tools are available there for farmers to enhance biodiversity on their farms and better link the habitats and the landscapes and the, uh, with biodiversity? So it's, it's kind of, are, is there anything there? Or I suppose what's, what's being pointed at there maybe is, is what do we need to put there or what mm. tools are needed to, to help farmers? Yeah, I guess uh, appropriate information that's uh, relevant to a farmer and at a farm scale. So for example, if you're lucky enough to be within the catchment area of one of the big EIP projects, so let's say you're in, a, in, in one of the pearl mussel catchments and you've decided to engage, you have a range of tools. You have relevant expertise available from agricultural and ecological advisors. You have scorecards. Uh, there's farmers up and down the country learning to identify different plant species so that they can help score their own fields. So we need more information that's uh, digestible and accessible to farmers and to farm planners. They're the other key. Farm planners are the other key level here. Um, so I think we need information resources that are relevant to the type of farming and the type of landscape that, that, that one is in. So I think that's one of the key provisions. And I think we are making huge leaps and bounds at the moment in terms of devising ways to communicate that type of information. And it gives so much more ownership uh, and understanding to farmers. Once a farmer understands, oh, that's what you mean by uh, less intensive. Oh, that's what you mean by more species. Oh, that plant. Oh, should we used to have lots of that? Once people start to see and make connections uh, between what, you know, what we're talking about in terms of increased biodiversity, uh, providing that knowledge in a way that's accessible and relevant to the lo local landscape is one of the, the, the key things. So I think some of those tools are in development and hopefully will be able to be, to be rolled out. And I think information is key and you would provide different information, but to the same aim to a farmer on the ground compared to somebody who, who you're trying to influence in terms of policy, um, policy change. Maria, has there been any uh, work done in relation to the carbon sequestration potential of semi-natural grasslands? This obviously is a major challenge facing the Irish agricultural sector and uh, we know that a lot of effort is going into protecting you know those those soils uh, and lands that uh, already are, 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 are you know good at sequestering uh, carbon yeah. uh, are you aware of any work that's been done this yeah way? yeah there's a, a good amount of work been done it's not something that I'm hugely familiar with but I am uh, some of the some of the key things if you are as you can imagine if you're tilling soil or if you're uh, reseeding, plowing and reseeding, you're going to be releasing a huge amount of carbon from the soil, the kind of labile carbon in the, the upper layers of the soil. Um, if you're apparently the, in terms of grasslands, they're quite good at storing carbon and particularly the healthier the grassland soil and definitely the, on the peatier ends, the peatier grasslands are very strong at, at storing carbon. Apparently the best management is kind of uh, low to moderate stocking levels for grazing. That's among the best ways we can optimize our carbon storage in our grasslands by moving to that kind of a, a low to medium stocking density uh, grazing model and least disturbance to the soil really makes kind of sense. Uh, so semi-natural grasslands have a, a strong role to play in, in carbon storage, but obviously um, peatier, wetter soils and, and in, in one thing that, that's important actually, it's an important nuance that's often missed. Uh, people often talk about planting trees to store carbon and they're, they're great carbon stores. But if you're planting a short rotation um, tree species, relatively short, like a Sitka spruce plantation, that's going to be, be clear felled or cut in some way and you're going to have the carbon cycling again. Grasslands, if they're managed long term for grazing, are a very stable store of grasslands. So longer term, they're very, very stable. And sometimes that can, at times, outweigh the benefits of shorter term forestry, certainly depending on, the, on the, how the forestry is managed. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions in, uh, in relation to climate change. Uh, have you any views in relation to the potential impact of, of, of climate change on our species rich grasslands? Hmm. Um, okay, I, 
there's there, work is certainly be done on that, but it's it's a tricky one. I think our semi-natural grasslands, like I kind of hinted at it in, in the talk, they do offer a good measure of resilience to us in terms of climate change. Interestingly, I, I'm sure people will remember in 2018, the, the long drought that summer, aerial photographs showed that a lot of our semi-natural grasslands looked greener for longer, whereas a lot of our intent, more intensively managed grasslands browned off very quickly that year in the drought. And that reminded me and reminded a lot of people of the resilience. Some of, our, the, some of the plants that were found in those more diverse uh, grasslands had deeper roots so they could access water for longer. They had better water resistant ca capabilities, maybe slightly waxier leaves or uh, I don't know, you know, more basal growing leaves, various different characteristics that meant they were more able to tolerate drought. So what, what we do is we have a bit of an insurance policy against future climate change if we have more diverse grasslands. Like anything, if you reduce things to a monoculture, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. So the more simplified our agricultural systems are, the more they are at risk to big changes like climate change. And one of the other things in floodplains, some kind of areas of grasslands that flood, maybe along the Shannon Callows, the Suck, the Brosna, a lot of those areas, the Moy, a lot of those grasslands where they have well-maintained grasslands and good healthy soils, they're much more absorbent soils. They hold the water better and for longer than soils that are compacted and compromised through maybe inappropriate management. So there is, there, there's, there's a lot to be, there's a lot of benefits to be gained from low intensity management of our semi-natural grasslands in terms of the changes that we're inevitably going to be seeing over the coming decades. Okay, and uh, a question there in relation to uh, uh, biodiversity loss. Is there a difference in biodiversity loss uh, between sites using chemical fertilizer and uh, sites using organic? And, and I suppose the inference is, is it about the type or is it about the quantity? Right, I, I don't know. I'm sure somebody has looked at that. I don't know off the top of my head, but I can say it is more about the quantity than the type. However, if you have to fertilize the, the type, uh, it, it, it's, it's better, it's more natural, the nutrients are cycling within their own system if it's slurry or farmyard manure that's going out rather than, than inorganic. However, it's more about the quantity, I would say, in terms of the fact that some species just do not compete well when the nutrients are elevated. Some do, and that means you get, you get lost. You get a change in the species, a, a small handful start to, to dominate when the nutrients are elevated. And that's less about where the nutrients come from and more about the amount or the, or the change or the increase in nutrients. Okay, uh, a question from Andy Bleasdale. Uh, thank you for a great presentation, Maria. Uh, how do we ensure protection of semi-natural semi grassland uh, when many of them are not uh, protected by designation? And I suppose, I suppose they're asking about the potential role of, of designation there. Mm. Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> I think one of the key things is this change in mindset and this need for a, for, a, for a broader appreciation of the value of these habitats. That's the key thing that's going to help us protect them. We can't make every, and nor do we want to ever, make every piece of semi-natural grassland uh, into a designated SAC or some other designation. That's not practical. It's, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna get us where we wanna be. So what we want is a better appreciation and understanding and valuing of, of these habitats. So I think it's gonna need to be through a combination of education, of farmers, of policy, uh, of uh, ag advisors, and then of policymakers. But it's also gonna need to come via incentivization. We're gonna need to pay to support the production of the services that these that these grasslands can give us, which include production, but also have all these other biodiversity, carbon and climate change benefits as well. So I think the protection is going to come from recognizing their value, accurately recognizing their value at, at where they are and what they are, and then actively supporting and valuing the, the farmers that farm them well and providing the, the tools and the information about what that means how best to farm these areas to maximize their benefits across this, uh, uh, you know, a series of different um, elements. Okay, I'm afraid, uh, Pat, we're, we're right yeah. up on time. And uh, we, I, unfortunately, we do have a lot more questions coming in, uh, but uh, huge, huge interest in your presentation, Maria. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I really, really enjoyed your presentation and uh, Great. inspiring, uh, to say the least. Great. And, uh, thank you so much. You, you've given a lot of uh, food for thought. 
Uh, my own belief is that we really are, uh, there is a, a renewed determination within the agri-food sector to, to really to, to, to address these problems. So I, I think we're, we're, we're at a good time in agriculture yeah. to address these things. We have the new cap uh, about to, to be agreed. And uh, I, I think uh, we've learned a huge amount from schemes over the last uh, number of decades. So let's put all of those into, to, yeah. into action. So I, I really do believe that. So uh, thank you again for, for your time and your effort. And uh, we uh, just remind people that your presentation will be available on the Chagask website and also recording of today's uh, uh, webinar will be available on YouTube as well. So finally, I just want to thank our production team, Andy Boland, uh, Catherine Keena for organizing this uh, Biodiversity Month, uh, Pat Murphy, of course, for helping questions and uh, Yvonne Maher as well on our social, social media side of, of the house. Next week, uh, we'll be speaking to per Eric Melander, who is chief scientist with the Agricultural Catchments Program, uh, which is looking at monitor, it monitors water quality. And uh, per Eric is going to be presenting some of the findings uh, for, that have been developed over the last 11 years of, of monitoring throughout Ireland. So with that, uh, thank you for tuning in to us today. And uh, we look forward to, to talking to you again next week. Thanks again, Maria. Thank you very much. And thank you, Pat. You're welcome. Bye-bye.